Good evening. Thank you for all coming out on this lovely summer evening. Tonight uh, we're going to be talking about uh, gifted and talented and uh, high expectations. And uh, Connie, you're going to be chairing this workshop. Mm -hmm. So I pass the, the gavel to you. <laughs> I need a gavel for, for a workshop. Uh, yes, and I do want to say thank you to people um, who come out um, when the weather is as attractive as it is, and that we also, in, in competition, unfortunately, with so many other activities. Uh, as I said at our last meeting, when we were talking about having the board meeting, workshop tonight, I recognize that even in this building we have competing um, school activities, but unfortunately this time of year, it's almost impossible to find a time when these conflicts don't occur. So having said as much and uh, feeling somewhat <coughs> apologetic for those conflicts, um, I am appreciative of your coming and we will try to make the evening um, worth it. Actually, I think I will stand. I'm not going to use any charts, but the, uh, <laughs> I was watching TV last week, uh, and uh, I've always noticed in the papers when famous people are about the same height, and then I try to see how they deal with some of the issues that some of us who are short have to cope with. <laughs> and I noticed that uh, Queen Elizabeth, who happens to be also five foot two, there are a few other differences, of course. <laughs> we are about the same height. And I noticed that she ran into the perennial problem that short people run into with podium. Uh, perhaps I should say podii, but anyway. The, uh, uh, if you saw that particular broadcast, um, President Bush, who is, of course, quite tall, had been delivering an address in the Rose Garden or wherever, and you could see him quite nicely. And the podium had been adjusted for his height, and then she came forward and said a few things, but because of the way the podium was and because of the um, microphone and so forth, uh, as the commentator said, it really looked like a talking hat. <laughs> and, uh, so that uh, I prefer to stand. Uh, we don't have a podium tonight anyway. Um, it will at least avoid that particular problem. Our topic tonight was one that we talked uh, both internally, that is, the staff and myself, and also uh, members of the board who were interested in trying to get a handle on what are often very squishy subjects. And I'm not sure that we have a perfect handle, but we are at least making an attempt. <coughs> the, the two major issues we will be focusing on will be curriculum, and we're going to focus on our math curriculum. And Michael will be explaining in some detail um, what, in fact, the uh, plans are for next year and to some degree our plans down the road. Um, we also felt that there was a distinct connection we wanted to make between the issue of improved curriculum and curriculum development and the issue of gifted and talented because it seems that in, when you are looking at the organization of schools as a whole, these two topics simply do not exist in separate um, pieces. They are in fact very much interconnected and if you're going to talk about them in general long-range planning issues, we need to make some connections. Specifically, I also thought that it might be an opportunity to at least begin or address a, a series of issues that I think are extremely important for this community to consider. And I have promised everybody that I will limit myself to 15 minutes, and we have each we've taken <laughs> sworn uh, path that none of us will present anything more than 15 minutes so that we do, in fact, give you plenty of time to make comments, ask questions, and continue the dialogue as you might wish. Essentially, when we talk about curriculum and when we talk about programs such as Gifted and Talented, we are really most usefully thinking, I think you have to think about these things in the context of the American public school system. Essentially, we are in <coughs> a phase of a really uh, very active phase of change. And that change is being pushed at us as well as coming from within. Again, if you, uh, one of the 
pleasures of flying across the country, is looking down, if you fly during the day at least, and getting a wonderful geography lesson. I love looking down at the checkerboard square of the states in the middle of our country, looking at the Rockies and, of course, the sea to shine and sea aspects of that flight. But as a school person, I always notice that you see yellow school buses wherever you fly. It is a phenomenon of the American public school system that yellow school buses go in the mountains, they go on the plains, they go by the sea coast, and I raise that issue because what that really is saying in a very graphic way is that the dream of the immigrant, the dream of the original settler of this country who was interested in education, is that there is access to education throughout this country. It is easy for us to criticize the quality of public education, but we ought to start by understanding that the first goal of the American public school system was access. It was not when we set up our common schools, when we set up our big city systems, and when we set up our transportation systems in this state, and in many, many districts in the state of Maine, did not have free transportation to high school until well after World War II and that access to an education was a fundamental right that we have spent the whole century trying to pin down. We are now in a phase when we are not, not satisfied to have access to education and leave it up to the individual student and his or her family to be concerned about the quality of that education. We are now, as a people, truly concerned about equal quality, uh, equal output, does uh, the student not only have access to an education, but are we in fact doing the job? The whole thrust of high school education in this country, if you look at the statistics for how many people graduated from high school in the hundred years or so for this century, it's very interesting. Seven percent, give or take a few, the statistics are very hard to get hold of, of the population of the United States even went to high school before World War I. Probably something like 5% actually graduated from high school. The big curriculum argument in the 1890s was whether science was a respectable <coughs> high school subject and could be used to replace Greek. And in fact, that was a burning issue, and you can read the literature to find out just how burning it was. Science, of course, was only newly formulated in a sense as a school subject and clearly did not have the stature of a disciplined um, total subject as did the uh, Greek tradition or the humanities tradition. It may seem strange to think of that as a legitimate <coughs> argument, but it was in fact. After World War I, and my father used to tell me this and I remember it well from his own stories, it was the Doughboy's right to a high school education that really opened the doors to the idea of access to a high school education. And by the 1930s, we had approximately 27 to 30 percent of the American population graduating from high school. Again, about a third of the population. That statistic did not change much until after World War II. It would depend on, obviously, the community and the uh, interest of the parent community and so forth, but as a national statistic, only about 50% of the American public graduated from high school until after World War II. The phenomenon of another war pushed that frontier of access to an education into the college level. But until the 1950s, or at least until the late 40s in this day, because I know for a fact I remember this from my own experience, it was we all were in eighth grade classes with youngsters we knew were not going to go to high school. Furthermore, the first few jobs I applied for had lines on the application that said, where did you graduate from grammar school? It was perfectly acceptable, and there were, in fact, jobs available for people who had a grammar school education. I mention these things to emphasize how rapidly we forget that an access to a high school education is a relatively recent phenomenon. It is also important, I think, to re recognize that the current issue of quality education 
is, is also a fairly new phenomenon. It was assumed that if you were motivated, you got educated. So that much of the structure of American public education is really tied to giving you an opportunity as a student. If you work hard and you have the talent and so on and so forth, you will in fact succeed and graduate. But if you don't, well, that's really your problem, not the school's. We now have a very different attitude, and it's being driven by a number of things that are changing in society. So again, when we talk about school improvement in the, in the larger sense, what is it that has changed? First of all, we certainly expect everybody to be able to learn in some kind of classroom setting. For instance, I was at a um, uh, convention a few years ago, and I heard Al Shanker speaking about some of the, his own conviction is uh, the changes of his own thinking about what was expected for uh, school quality and so on. And he talked about one of the moments that had driven his thinking. He said he was talking to the president of General Motors who said, send me a student who can learn in a classroom. I think that's a fundamental issue. No longer can we graduate students from high school or have students drop out of high school or get through high school with a rather lackluster education and assume that they can get an apprentice program or assume that they can get a job where they will learn on the job. They may in fact do those kinds of things and I'm not saying that there aren't some uh, <coughs> substantive apprentice programs, but I think the point is as an adult in our society now, one has to be able to learn in a classroom. And all that that implies, it means that we have to graduate youngsters <coughs> who are able to think of themselves as learners in an academic setting. I would suggest that the vision that ought to be driving us is that we have schools that produce students who know what they know, who can talk in intelligent and informed ways about what they have learned, who have internalized intellectually respectable notions about what are the informing ideas of the given disciplines that they are studying, who have confidence in themselves as learners, who understand learning strategies that are specific to a variety of learning activities and who have the confidence in themselves to believe that they can keep on learning. Because we are all aware one of the changes that we have to cope with in changing our educational institutions is that we simply do not know anymore what there is to know. Nobody can go through school and memorize <coughs> a book. Nobody can pass or do well on various kinds of examinations by simply cramming the night before. All of those things that used to be time-honored ways of getting through school are simply not going to do the job anymore. We have simply <coughs> got to cope with the masses of information that are now uh, available to us. We have got to teach children strategies for absorbing and somehow getting to the heart of a matter of uh, again, masses of information, and even while we're struggling to learn those strategies ourselves, we have to figure out how to teach them to children. It is not an easy task. Furthermore, we are in a society that is changing, obviously changing, in many substantive ways, from a print information society to a visual society. This is, um, you know, uh, a time when I'm often reminded of reading Marshall McLuhan's books in the 50s, um, actually I guess they originally were published in the 40s, where he predicted that television would turn us back into a tribal village. Even small children are surrounded with piece, bits and pieces of information on an adult level that they may not understand, that they are going to have difficulty assimilating, and again the impact of this as a uh, an issue, a reality of the society in which we live, what does that mean for how we teach children? The impact is very hard to determine. <coughs> anyway, the issue uh, for us in schools now is to <coughs> think of all of these issues Think of all the strategy issues that we can. In the, in the meantime, going back to that access issue, we are simply not satisfied, nor can we be as a society, with saying, well, some kids get it and some kids don't, because our country and the society at large cannot tolerate that kind of attitude. 
schools cannot be labeling and sorting institutions where the survival of the fittest uh, makes it okay for people to fall down to various cracks. We have simply got to do better than that. At the same time, we all know that school is an environment that is more appealing to some children and to some adults than others. Many people learn in very active, hands-on, vigorous ways. How does a school cope with that? Uh, pedagogy, time-honored pedagogy, means that you have a class sitting in front of you and you do, in fact, get people to learn by rote memory or learn by some kind of, of uh, seat-based approach, which is still a perfectly useful way to teach many things, but it simply doesn't deal with the masses of information or, thank you very much, thank you, some of the challenges of pulling it all together. It certainly doesn't necessarily help us learn and cope with this whole issue of visual information. Some of that impact of the uh, visual information, uh, teachers have wonderful stories about what kids come in and the questions they ask and how bits and pieces of information float around in their heads. Parents have wonderful stories too and we should be sharing these things. One of my favorites um, occurred or was given to me by a teacher, and I think it was a second grade teacher, in a curriculum meeting a few years ago. We were talking about what's appropriate to teach to children for time and space concepts, how children in the first, second, third grade really have a great deal of difficulty uh, grasping space concepts in the sense of how far is something from something else. And she said, well, for instance, this was a few years ago, and Chernobyl had just occurred. The children had seen on news in their homes a good deal about this, and obviously some of them have had a lot of conversation at home with parents. But they still came in very worried, very upset. They knew that it was a terrible accident, but they didn't know much about it. And the teacher decided this would be a good lesson to use that visual information, to use what they were walking into the classroom for. So she stopped what she was normally doing. She got out a globe. She got out a map. She explained. She showed. She did everything she could think of to give these second graders a grasp of where Chernobyl was. It was a long way away, and it was terrible, but they didn't have to worry. It was not going to impact them, and so on. And finally, one little boy said, well, is it over one, is it on the other side of Route 125? He said, my mother won't let me cross Route 125. <laughs> so much for the sophisticated explanation. Uh, teachers can tell you that developmentally, children vary greatly that there are learning styles, that there are timing issues, there are attention issues, there are personality issues, there are talent issues. There are all kinds of reasons why a child may outstrip his peers or he may in fact be more interested in a particular subject than others. And these issues are what make the uh, challenge to teach the individual student particularly difficult. And that, of course, is the issue of gifted and talented to some degree, an access issue, a right to have an appropriate education, a right to be challenged, to be given substantive material, and uh, one in which uh, I think we have more agreement than disagreement. But the challenge for schools, again, is how do we have a structure that both meets changing needs of society, that is the print to visual, the tons of individual disconnected pieces of information that characterize, for instance, computer-based uh, facts. How do we teach synthesizing skills? How do we both complete our own education on an ongoing, we never complete it, how do we continue our own education as teachers? What I was taught for science in the 40s and 50s is, um, believe me, if that's all I knew about science, that would be a sad understanding <coughs> of the world. I mean, just an incredible challenge for any adult to keep up with what is uh, intellectually respectable to know whatever your area of expertise. All of these issues are issues that we are struggling with. Um, and so in dialogues like this or meetings like this, we're trying to help you um, understand some of our problems. We are asking for your understanding. We are asking for your input. But we'll also be uh, trying to involve you increasingly in some of the solutions. So leading to our two content areas tonight, Against that backdrop of absolute certain change, the only thing we know for sure is that schools have to change. We have to figure out some kind of structure that will enable us not only to guarantee access <coughs> to education, but in every way that we can to guarantee 
quality education for everybody. But that means in spite of individual motivation, in spite of individual maturity, in spite of a variety of, of uh, developmental issues, in spite of our own frailties of human knowledge, in spite of our own limited resources, we still have to hold that as our goal. So the two issues we want to explain, a few things that we see as at least steps in the right direction, by no means the final direction, would be uh, some issues in math and some issues in gifting and talent. And again, what we would like to do is to go through about a 15-minute discussion and then turn this open for discussion, questions, and answers. Questions and comments. Michael. I'm going to try to walk you through quickly uh, where we are with math curriculum. Okay. Uh, um, the central, the central purpose, really, in in our work in math curriculum, uh, the, the driving issue <coughs> is. Michael, stand, stand on this side of it if you would, because I see blocking okay. view down there. So the third. So I pulled the library and I asked for an easel. I didn't specify what kind of easel. This one probably is Okay. Okay, our central issue is to increase achievement level <coughs> of our students. I mean, th there's a lot of issues that you could organize curriculum work around, and there's a myriad of issues that swirl around our curriculum work in, in one of the areas. For example, um, there's the variation of MEA scores, the main educational assessment scores from year to year. That gets a lot of attention. In particular, uh, two issues that really get highlighted by those scores are uh, in math education are the differences uh, between girls and boys achievement levels, gender differences in math education. Uh, another issue that's very much highlighted by these scores is the difference in achievement <coughs> levels between the students who are in college tracks versus the students who are non-college uh, programs at high school. All those other myriads of issues really uh, are just subtopics underneath this major issue of, how, of why we're trying to reorganize math curriculum. The issue is our achievement levels of our students. That's what we're trying to address as we go about working on math curriculum. This issue uh, is, not, is not unique to Cape Elizabeth. It's, it's a national issue. It's not unique to any one grade level or any one building. Uh, it's very much a K through 12 uh, issue the levels that students uh, are attaining at any one grade level are very much an issue of that grade level and the levels before. I won't quote all the research that documents that. But <coughs> okay. we've, we've been working hard on staff development. And I want to tell you a little about the background of our staff development and where, where it is right now. There are two <coughs> strains. I, I, I've divided our staff development work into two strains. Strand A, which has to do with, uh, you see this? with the math training and the math instruction training of our faculty. Is strand A. Strand B is the actual curriculum writing or curriculum rewriting. And by necessity, I feel, we've been working a lot longer on the math training and math instruction training uh, before we started trying to rewrite curriculum. Okay? So there's a much more of a history in terms of strand A than there is in terms of strand B, the curriculum rewriting. Um, What we've been, we, we have worked, this, this year really uh, ends the work, I'm coming this slide now. Uh, we've been working for four years with Rachel McAnellan. Uh, in those years, 
two of the years <coughs> uh, sponsored her at, uh, in a residency program here in Cape Elizabeth. And part of, part of what's reflected there is that we have near 100% participation of our faculty. Uh, it's, it's probably a bit less than that now because we, because we have constant turnover in faculty. So some of our new hires have come after the major opportunities to work with Rachel. That work with Rachel focused on increasing teachers' depth of understanding in mathematics, increasing teachers' repertoire of uh, instructional strategies with students, with particular sensitivity to uh, developmental issues and gender differences. Okay? Outstanding consultant that we've had access to in Strand A. A, str uh, a second major piece of Strand A is that we regularly uh, send people, uh, teachers want to go to conferences and workshop opportunities. The major the major opportunity that exists for us now and will continue to exist for us in the upcoming years, given uh, all the uh, fiscal constraints we operate under, is the uh, training and uh, workshop opportunities through the Southern Maine Partnership. We've been very active in, uh, in the math strand that's, that's go that goes on through the Southern Maine Partnership, headed up by Nancy Austin. We've been, uh, we've, we've uh, invested a lot in sending our faculty to PRISM workshops uh, each, each of the last three years, I think. PRISM stands for Problem Solving in Science and Mathematics. It's gotten immensely popular. It started, it's sponsored by the State Department. It started out that they ran one PRISM conference a year. Now they're up to two PRISM conferences a year, and they still have waiting lists. There were so many people wanted to go to the elementary conference this spring that they're going to repeat it again next fall. Uh, we've always sent teams of three, four, or five to these conferences. <coughs> uh, one of the reasons why they're excellent is they've had some of the best math and science people in the nation have, have, have come through, uh, have come through here. This is usually up in Rockport. When we've been able to afford it, we've sent people to, to our regional NCTM conferences. That stands for the National Council for Teachers of Mathematics. That's the same group that's just recently published the new NCTM standards, and it's those standards which are really excellent, which have really become part of the debate about national curriculums and national standards. Um, this, this, is, this is almost a model <coughs> for something like a national curriculum could look like. We have a number of uh, our faculty who are taking math, uh, uh, math courses at the college <coughs> level. That's continues to, and that's going to continue this summer. Some of the other regular conferences that we go to, Madeline Burns is a person who's done an awful lot of work with uh, uh, critical thinking and uh, really powerful use of manipulatives in mathematics. Uh, we, <coughs> We've gone to Marilyn Burns workshops as, as we've had access to them. One thing that I like to do is I like to go to all the workshops that are offered by publishers. I go to as many of these as I, as I can. I keep up on what the publishing houses are doing. Their material is getting better and better now. Uh, and some interesting stuff is coming out of some, uh, out of, some of these companies. The third element, then, of uh, what we've been doing to increase the skill levels of, of our teachers uh, is that we've operated in-house uh, programs. <coughs> this last year, Gary Record at Pine Cove, Charlotte Hanna at the middle school, Don Richards at the high school, have all run in service programs for their respective faculties. Uh, they had the opportunity to do that. They've done that after school, and they've done it on some of the early release days. Uh, this is really important to us. It really allows us to focus on exactly what, what, what we want to make available. Uh, Gary and I have already identified uh, how we want to use some of our available in service time for next year at K-5. In particular, and, and what that is, is we want to make use of the new 
the University of Chicago Elementary Program, which is just beginning to come out. And, uh, I'm excited about it. Okay, SAMB is our actual curriculum development and writing. This started, this only started last summer. Last summer was the first summer I uh, specified for curriculum writing. And I don't have near enough time to share with you the multitudes of information. But I'm going to, I'm going to hand this out. Uh, two reports. One is uh, a goal statement that I wrote for uh, <coughs> Connie for exactly what our goals are for the 1991 summer work. In that packet, you'll, re you'll really see an overview of exactly the way we're writing uh, curriculum and exactly where we are in the writing. And uh, the second piece is a math assessment proposal that, I, that we just submitted to the assessment group at the Southern Maine Partnership. I heard, vague, I heard vaguely yesterday that I think this grant is getting approved, but I don't have any official confirmation on that. Uh, but it's particularly uh, a request for grant money to work specifically on assessment, and I'm giving you a copy of that. Okay, so let me, let me hand that out now. I'll Just a second, almost organized. <laughs> You all too. And there's one thing that when we made, when I copied this, if you look at this sheet, right, this table right here, this is a table of the overview of the curriculum work that's happened thus far at K through five, and that's that was color coded, color coded on the original, and it copied in such a way that you can't read it. So if you would write this in, okay, so, so you can make some sense out of this. The fourth column over is the, is the focus area entitled <coughs> measurement. Then the fifth column is money, which is clear. The sixth column is numeration and number theory. And then the next column over is operations. And the operations column is what, <coughs> is what usually is, is the column where we're calling operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, which people usually mean when they say computation. Okay? There's a tremendous amount of information in that. It can really give you an overview, I think, of exactly where we are in curriculum writing. <coughs> These staff development strands have led to uh, two structural changes that we, that we want to implement for next year in implementing this policy around uh, in increasing math achievement levels for our students. Okay? The, the first recommendation really comes out of the first strand, which is to increase the depth of knowledge of our teachers in mathematics. I want to make a distinction, too. I can make more distinctions than just these two, but let me leave it at two. When I wrote Strand A, I talked about math training, which is uh, the, uh, how much mathematics uh, a teacher knows as, as a distinct area from math uh, instruction training which is the issue of, the, of, of instruction and instructional technique. I see those as somewhat independent, and our training has really focused on them in a somewhat independent way. Part of the job is to increase math knowledge, but you could do that and not necessarily improve instruction. Okay? So we find it for both. Um, this first structural <coughs> change, then, is that we want to begin uh, teacher specialization at grade four. I first, uh, this, I think this is the only time I'll digress in this talk because I'm limited. I think I first heard this idea uh, a year ago when I was listening to Zalu Siskin, uh, 
uh, uh, Zhao <laughs> is the prime author of, uh, of the University of Chicago mathematics project, which we're making a lot of use of. And he talked about, in terms of math reform, the need to have specialization starting with grade four. My initial reaction back then was that that's a bad idea. The kids are too young. They still need one teacher. Self-contained is the better model. You see, in only a little over a year, I've come 180 degrees around. Um, I feel now that uh, we do need to begin specializing at, uh, at grade four. Uh, we've uh, <coughs> the grade four. Okay, let me stop. What we, what we have through this year is we've had all self-contained classrooms in grades four, five, and six. Grade six really has done a lot of teaming this year. That's not an accurate statement. Uh, there's probably been some teaming going on in grades four and five also, but the model's been more self-contained. Uh, along with some teachers at grade seven who teach three subjects, okay? which I'm defining specialization here as <coughs> teachers teaching no more than two subjects so that they really have the time and the means to be in depth in two of the, in the two subject areas that they teach. Okay, so that so cutting down on their preparations, cutting down on the fields in which they're going to increase their expertise in. Um, in doing this, however, there's myriads of, of um, factors. Um, <coughs> And when we started the debates with these teams, we made it clear to the teams that the teachers needed to be comfortable with this. They needed to be able to hook up with a, with a partner who they could work with, and that the teachers who really didn't feel like they were ready to specialize and wanted to stay self-contained, that was a valid choice. There's good reasons for maintaining self-contained also. So sort of like nothing comes for free. Um, so, uh, what we're going to have for next year um, at grade four, there'll be uh, there's six classes at grade four. Four of the classes will have teacher teams that the teachers are specializing. Two of the classes will be self-contained. That's a recommendation that comes from allowing teachers to really specialize, increase their expertise in two areas, rather than trying to cover four areas. Okay. At grade five, the breakdown will be, in grade five there, is, there are eight classes, the breakdown will be five classrooms with teachers specialized, three classrooms that are self-contained. And at grade six, uh, all, the class, all the classrooms will be teamed, all the classrooms will be specialized as will grade seven. Okay. The second structural, uh, I'm, avoiding, I'm avoiding, avoiding the use of that word restructure. The second structural change uh, really comes more out of strand B, our curriculum writing. Uh, and that is, up until now, we've begun our leveling at grade eight with eighth graders having a choice of algebra one or transitional math. We implemented transitional math this year at eighth grade. This is our new University of Chicago program, transitional math and algebra one. But traditionally, the leveling, the choices in math has, have only started here at grade eight. This recommendation here uh, for implementation next year is that we want to start these choices, this leveling will start at grade seven with choices of transitional math or our grade seven math program. Which is? <coughs> which, which, which is, which, which we wrote. It's kind of, uh, um, it's kind of midway between Addison Wesley grade seven and transitional math. And why That's don't we have algebra there as University of Chicago presents it for the children who um, have tested the 90th percentile on the um, a standardized math test? I'm just curious why we chose not to do that. 
testimony, you think? Well, I'm, I'm not sure the format. Okay, um, I think that one of the um, one of the issues that I was going to kind of try to summarize this thing, but anyway, maybe I don't want to cut you off, Michael, but just, but just about use your 15 minutes anyway. I know. Um, <laughs> <coughs> what I started out by saying is that change is coming and that the change is in the direction of going from an emphasis a century of equal access to what will probably not be a century, um, we won't be given a century to get to equal outcome. But that all youngsters have to have a right to have a quality program, that we can't just deal with quality programs for a limited number, some of whom get it, some of whom don't. We really have to set our goals much higher than that. Higher expectations for all students, obviously. Now, what we envision is that this is what we are capable of doing right now, and I do believe that uh, you know, there is a possibility that we will, in fact, be able to respond to a seventh grade algebra class as a gifted and talented strand. Uh, I think we're doing that, or at least we've had some discussions about that. But what the goal is, is that with the teacher development, with the specialization, with the curriculum writing, and with the expectation that it is not if you're going to take algebra, but when you're going to take algebra, that the curriculum development in this particular school system will have as a specific goal algebra, although I understand it's really not quite accurate anymore to call anything algebra because it is supposed to be, according to uh, Council of Math Standards, uh, there is um, a distinct need to wrap probability statistics and a variety of other issues into all our thinking about the so-called traditional strains of math. But for simplification's sake, let's just say algebra. Uh, this is a dramatic difference in the last, uh, in fact, even now. We do not necessarily expect every single student to actually become proficient <coughs> at, in a, at a quality level in algebra. What we are pushing for in this is a um, model that will give us as a school system um, the expectation that all our students will in fact have proficiency level and intellectually respectable academic skills. This is not to say that we want to ignore all other kinds of issues. They're important and we're not talking about um, using so much time on this particular issue that all other things get squeezed out. But there are a number of issues. Because algebra has not been seen as a uh, as an, an absolute necessity for all youngsters going through uh, upper grades uh, in the American public school system, and only in some fairly narrow base uh, has it been seen as uh, necessarily uh, in uh, private schools. <coughs> it takes some very careful planning for us to do it right. Part of this is to reach into the elementary grades where teachers did not traditionally have a strong background on math. Teachers. Um, up until very recent years, um, even graduating <coughs> from, from rather prestigious teacher preparation programs. If you were an elementary teacher, you were required <coughs> to take a music class, an art class, you had your uh, piano in the room, and uh, you <coughs> took math methods, and you took uh, reading methods, and uh, you got with it. I mean, people gave you a basil, and that you ran the kids through a program. We were talking about a major shift of asking our teachers to have an internalized, intellectually respectable understanding of the important ideas that inform discipline. This, frankly, wasn't required of high school teachers a generation ago. It is certainly required of our high school teachers for academically able students, and that, of course, is a given at this particular stage, and certainly in a community like this. But what we are trying to get a handle on is how do we do this in a way that we will not botch it while we're going through. None of you want your children experimented on, nor do we <coughs> wish to experiment on them ourselves. So it is important for us to think through what we can do, what we can do well, at what pace we can do it, and what our children uh, are capable of doing too. So the goal here is to probably, and I'll say probably because I don't know <coughs> exactly what this will be, but through a combination of leveling and specialization, we will have some youngsters taking algebra perhaps as early as the sixth grade, some at the seventh, some at the eighth, and some at the ninth, which is um, uh, probably leads us into gifted and talented because what we are now uh, set up to do is uh, some 
some attention to children who are either obviously notably gifted or particularly interested in a math strand, which is the most obvious one for acceleration, and the only time we ever really get out of the sequence of teaching a particular subject is when we have done it really different, kind of like level three, possibly level two stream. Uh, I'd be happy to explain that, but that is essentially where our thinking is now and where we're headed now. Um, I have one other question on that. Yes. So what children will be in um, regular math and what children will be chosen for transitional math? Well, I think that right now we will be using the normal ways in which leveling is occurring, that is by achievement achievement scores, teacher um, observation, teacher recommendation, and clearly a parent. So children who are achieving hot, more highly, high, achieving higher on standardized tests will take transitional math, and children who aren't scoring as high will be taking their regular math? Yeah, actually, also, uh, Charlotte Hanna and Mary McGuire, two of our eighth grade teachers, and Charlotte is our math coordinator in the middle school as well, too, have developed an assessment uh, for transition math. They've both been teaching math this year and an assessment piece that will indicate skills and understandings that students need to have so that they can be successful in that program. Within the next couple of weeks, all of our sixth grade students will take that. So that will be another piece of information. Um, the biggest piece, though, will be the year-long performance <coughs> and what they've done in the classroom. We don't have a developmental test. I remember at the last meeting a big point was made that this is going up to algebra that children have to be developmentally ready. So I, I felt personally that that was giving the wrong message to parents because I really felt it was academic performance, not developmental. But I was thinking if you really feel it is developmental, do we have a developmental test? I for think algebra? when we were referring to developmental issues at that time, Kay, we were looking at the ability for abstract thinking and their basic understanding of problem solving and some issues which are on this test that. Um, Charlotte Hanna and Mary McGuire have developed. One last question. I'm confused. If we're uni using University of Chicago curriculum, and that's our goal, to use that throughout the system, why are we still developing our own curriculum? Or are those two things compatible? I'm a little bit confused. What, what curriculum should we expect? University of Chicago or Cape Elizabeth curriculum? Um, that's a good question. I think one of the big mistakes that, it, that has been made in the last 20 years was for schools to simply uh, buy programs and to trust published curriculum and to <laughs> shut our minds off and to, simply, and to simply assume that the publishers really knew what was best. Uh, those published materials in the last 20 years have gotten weaker and weaker. I, uh, <coughs> I would like to not ever make that mistake again. I think whatever programs we get, uh, we need to stay very critical of them. <coughs> I think there's lots of good programs around. I see us putting together a Cape Elizabeth program that's made up of strong elements from lots of programs. Uh, right now, University <coughs> of Chicago, I think, is one of the strongest programs around. But based on our experiences this first year with it, there's rewriting of it that we want to do. And we're going to rewrite it? Yep. That's, uh -huh. part, of, that's part of what we're going to try working on this summer. So I think uh, that program will be our, I should say, will be a, it'll be our core. It's, I think the, the teachers were especially happy with it in, uh, in geometry at the high school. Uh, we were... We were happy with it, and, and we, we implemented it this year in transitional math, in algebra one, and in geometry. And people are uh, exceedingly happy with the geometry program. They're happy with algebra one. There are pieces of transitional math that aren't that aren't good enough that we, that we need to rework. But basically, it's a strong program. We're going to keep it as a structure. But there are but there are pieces of it uh, that we could do better than. What do we know, what objective thing do we have now to show us that, in fact, our curriculum is better than it has been? <coughs> do we have any objective measurement? Do you mean we, do we have some kind of standard test that we could get kids every single year? <coughs> Just some kind of objective measurement. I don't know what it would be. Like, how do we know that, in fact, we're doing better? Well, 
I'm just wondering is if I know a lot of us are here because we have questions and concerns and we'd like to ask them and I I'm specifically not here about the gifted and talented I'm, I'm here more about the uh, expectations for all students and I'm wondering if I can perhaps ask a few questions and make a few points at this juncture before a formal presentation by the gifted and talented uh, fellow there that's fine I think for instance just just to interject and pick up on the assessment issue um, Michael did mention for instance uh, several teachers and administrators in the system have written so many grants for the assessment center which is a function of the partnership at USM um, there is I think anybody reading the papers must be aware of a national cry for better testing. Been, I think every day this week there has been an article in the paper about a variety of issues including math testing. And uh, the, we are getting some specific help through the partnership and through that assessment center and, and uh, the piece that Michael is talking about is specifically geared just to this program. As far as other testing goes, um, I, would, I can't speak to years in the past, but we have an evolving program here but we are writing in assessment as part of that program. Yes. Well, I'd like to basically make about three points. Um, I'd like to talk for just a moment or two on each of the points, and I'd like to really conclude by asking one question on each of the three points. Um, I taught for a year at Boston College High School um, many years ago now, and I, and I taught a couple of classes that uh, were made up of kids who only wanted to go to medical school and they were great students and they never gave me any hassle and it was a wonderful experience and if I hadn't gotten into medical school myself I probably would have been a teacher. But um, what I remember from my day was that it was very important to do well on SATs. And I want to bring up this issue in another capacity. I, um, I'm currently on the admissions committee uh, for Boston College in Southern Maine. And over the last five years, I have interviewed about 55 kids from Cape Elizabeth, South Portland, uh, kids that go to Chevres, kids that go to Catherine McCauley. I have a very, very difficult time getting kids from Cape Elizabeth into Boston College. Um, the average combined SAT scores for the Cape Elizabeth kids that I have seen over the last six years is a 1079. That's the average score. Now these are kids who are uh, straight A students, you know, number two, number three in the classes, and the the standard national scores are not competitive with other kids who are applying to BC. This year, uh, I couldn't get any student from Cape Elizabeth into Boston College. I got two kids from South Portland High School two kids from Scarborough, one from Chevres, uh, and one from Macaulay. Not one student who I saw this year had combined SAT scores of 1,200. Now, 1,200 is a cutoff for BC. I'm not saying that SATs are the, the sine qua non of the, the world, but if you don't have 1,200s, <coughs> BC isn't going to look at you. Now, I don't know how that works for other schools. I'm not making an indictment on the, the process. but. I think we have a problem if the average is 1079 with a, a, a young man or woman who's trying to get into BC who clearly wants to go to the school and clearly in all other areas is doing very well. I mean, they're, they're, they're things look great. I mean, they're carrier pigeons. They're doing everything after hours. They've got great grades. But they simply aren't doing it on national tests. And I think we have a major problem here in Cape Elizabeth with not preparing kids for these national standardized tests. And we're not, we're putting our heads in the sand. And so my question is, what are we going to do to solve that problem? My second point, numbers to me uh, tell a lot. The recent MEAs, people are going to assassinate me about these MEAs because everyone's been talking about them ever since they were published. But, but it's interesting if you look at the numbers in other school districts. Uh, our six areas in the MEAs for the middle school all dropped given the four-year average in every area. This year's scores dropped in every single area. Uh, we were beaten, if you want to put it that way, by uh, the consolidated Blue Hill School District, by Damariscotta in all areas. 
Uh, Greeley and Cumberland beat us in all areas. Falmouth beat us in four of the six. Orono beat us in four of the six, and Yarmouth beat us in four of the six. But one statistic that I found uh, very interesting was the Hamden School District. They improved in all six areas based on their four-year average in all the six areas. And I would think someone ought to call Hamden and say, what are you guys doing? Or we ought to be calling Greeley and saying, what are you guys doing? I mean, how, how are you getting the 400s in math? And we're dropping down. And I can only respond um, by, by giving a couple of anecdotes. My, uh, my youngest son, who was in the third grade last year, was coloring nickels and dimes and pennies uh, until he ran out of crayons. I mean, this just went on for months and months and months. That was his math, coloring little, little coins. And we just kept assuming that, you know, the next week he'd start something new. But uh, fourth grade year, they started long division in January. And when we met with his teacher, she said, yeah, we really should have started a little bit earlier. So whatever we're doing, I mean, we're, not, we're, we're simply not doing it well. And I think on both of those two areas, and, and my second question based on the MEAs is, you know, what are we going to do with respect to uh, improving the ability for, for all the kids in the, in the general expectations to do well in all of these areas, and, and simply not just the, uh, the gifted and the talented? And, and the last point I want to make, and the, and the last question I want to ask is, um, in talking to some friends up in the Bangor area, uh, apparently this uh, Odyssey of the Mind uh, program is very big in southern Maine. Now, maybe it's big here, and I'm just, I didn't hear about it or something, but this is a program that I'm told uh, the average kids really kind of band together academically like they do Chewankee athletically and they compete all over the country and literally all over the world. <coughs> and, you know, it was interesting. I was in Houston a couple of months ago for a National League of Cities conference, and Ross Perot, I think, made a very important point. You know, our kids here are competing with Japan. I mean, they're not competing with Buxton. I mean, they're not competing with uh, some of the uh, less gifted areas in Maine. And if we think and, and, uh, that because we're in the top 10% of Maine on these standardized scores, that we're doing something extraordinary, uh, I, I protest that we're not. Uh, we're, we're simply losing something somewhere. And I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, those are my three points. And, and my last question was, uh, why are we not doing Odyssey of the Mind, or are we considering it? And if we are doing it, uh, I'll apologize for taking your time. But it really seems to me somehow we're missing the boat. Uh, the kids are not finishing up competitively <coughs> with the national story. I mean, we might look good in Maine, but I can tell you having come from a school district in Simsbury, Connecticut, that had an average of 10 to 15 national merit scholars in their graduating class, uh, we really can't live on the reputation of Cape Elizabeth. I think we've got to look very, very seriously uh, at the scores that are falling and make some very, very concerted efforts to turn them around. And if what Michael says about math is going to do that, fine. I, I'm very hopeful it is. But I'm just trying to give my perspective with raw data that frustrate me because I would love to get Cape kids uh, into Boston College. I simply can't do it if they don't have the national scores. And if we keep telling ourselves that the SATs are not important as they uh, make up about 20% of the uh, admissions criteria, we're not going to get kids into Boston College. Well, I'd like to respond a couple of things. Number one, that was one of my questions <laughs> as I've wandered around the schools in the last few, few weeks. Um, <clears throat> I think that, uh, and in fact, uh, in talking to some of the high school teachers about the SATs, there's all kinds of reasons for that, and I, I certainly think that uh, the, the only thing I want to say is that I think there are a lot of us who are concerned about similar issues. Um, however, an interesting comment was made by one teacher as far as the SATs. Uh, she said, uh, unfortunately, the youngsters in the high school are not reading enough. Um, now, 
uh, there is a lot of the SAT, and I'm not talking necessarily about math. Math is a specialized instruction, and that's another whole set of issues, obviously. But let's just talk about that particular comment. Um, I happened to be in a ninth grade classroom, and I asked the kids, how many of you read a couple of books a week that you don't have to read? I think one youngster raised your hand. How many of you read a serious book at least once every two weeks? One kid just said, you know, she laughed. She said, I might read one book a year. I mean, this is, you're absolutely right. This is a huge issue, and it's a, it is certainly a concern to the school. It's a concern to me. It's a concern to every administrator, board member, or teacher that I've talked to. Um, and I don't hear people feeling like sitting on their laurels. I mean, I think that what happened with Cape Elizabeth is that it was a community that uh, 20 years ago had a high percentage of college-bound youngsters um, scored high on most of the, uh, if not all, of the normal standardized tests, had its share of pretty good SATs, and nobody really expected that much more. What we now have is a very different clientele and a very different set of customer expectations. And I really believe we have to listen very carefully to those. I think we share that kind of thing. Um, but I do, I do suggest to you as parents, I mean, I know I've taken my share of standardized tests at stretch and, and uh, look at the results and so on. We have simply got, and this is our responsibility as a school system, to teach intellectually demanding stuff to everybody, some sooner than others. I mean, that's sort of what I think we have embedded in this, um, this, this outline of what we intend to do in a systematic way to improve the content of math to hold expectations, to look at what the kids are actually doing, and to to try to come to grips with just these issues. Uh, but I do think that um, that it's a multi-phased, and you know, it's a, I'm not trying to cop out. I'm just saying, yes, it's a problem, and there's a lot that needs to be done. Honey? I think we ought to, uh, matter of fairness, uh, I saw a couple of hands go up oh, quickly, sure. anticipating me, just have anybody else who'd like to speak. <coughs> for two or three minutes, along with some <coughs> types of comments, the, the type of presentation exactly. that Wayne just made. So why don't we do that, uh, Margaret? Yes, I'd like to respond to this new plan for for the uh, classrooms, grades four and five, where you're going to be having some uh, classrooms where the teachers specialize and some where they're self-contained. Now, the impression I got from your presentation is that perhaps. Um, a classroom where a teacher specializes is a better situation, and if that is the case, why are you still going to have some self-contained rooms? That's my first question. Um, my second question is, you say that you're going to be doing leveling at, uh, at grade 7. Uh, they used to do leveling at grade 3, and that's probably a little bit too young. But I'm very concerned about the fact that you're trying to teach math in a heterogeneous manner. I think it's impossible. I think that there are some children that are ready to go, and they are held back. Um, you know, this, this comment about um, having long division in January, some children in first grade <coughs> haven't even had long division yet. There's no consistency, there's no consensus yet. I will talk to my friends, and when they hear what my son is getting compared to what their children are getting, you know, it, 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 it just doesn't work. And so you say that you're going to be going to um, more uh, specialized teaching, let's say, of math. Well, you used to do that. Why did you leave it? Because when my daughter was in the system, they specialized in math and in reading, third, fourth, fifth grade. It was in sixth grade when they started putting everybody all together in a melting pot, and that's when we left after sixth grade, because it was such a disappointing experience. So I'll reiterate my questions. Number one, why are some going to be specialized and some will, why will some still be self-contained? And number two, do you still <coughs> plan on teaching math in a heterogeneous setting, except for the gifted and talented? Up through sixth grade. Up through sixth grade. Should we get all the, all the questions and subjects out uh, quickly? Should we continue sure. with that, or should we answer that one? Well, yeah. answer that. well <laughs> my question was similar to Margaret. says, should I be concerned that my child will be entering fifth <coughs> grade next year, be in a classroom where teachers are specializing, and presumably in math, which is an area I'm very concerned about. I don't think my child is really being challenged in math. I agree with Margaret's comments. That is, I don't think there's consistency from what I've seen 
in, in math curriculum. It's as though a math curriculum has been thrown away and no other curriculum has been put in place. At least that's the perception I have. Maybe I'm wrong, but I went to the math night that was conducted earlier in the year, and, and I've taken more and more interest in what my child's doing in math, and I'm very unsatisfied with what's happening. And now I look at this and say, well, hmm, what's going to happen to him next year? Am I, if, he, if he goes into a classroom that's self-contained, do I have reason to be concerned that he'll fall behind further in that? Well, do you want me to come in? Yeah, let's see. Well, which well, format are we going to follow? Oh, that's nice. Let's get them all out, or are we going to answer? No, I think they'll forget. Yeah. Yeah. I think we should answer some, too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there, there is a curriculum in place. It's uh, and, and and it's outlined and, and it's it's fairly detailed. Okay. <coughs> so your child should be getting the same coverage of material, no matter what classroom they're in <coughs> in the fifth grade, because because that curriculum is outlined for every fifth grade classroom. I, th I think part of the, I, th I think part of the, we made the decision that we wanted that we were not going to force teachers into one structure or the other. That we want the teachers to debate amongst themselves whether they wanted a team and specialize or whether they wanted to say, stay self-contained at this point. I suspect that the demands of the curriculum in the future are going to push more people to want to specialize. But but part of what you give away in specializing is, is the teacher having one adult that they relate to all day. Uh, more consistency, more consistency, more care, more care for the child. That's part of the trade-off when you start specializing. Um, so I, 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 I think I think that what we have now really has maximized uh, teachers' talents and skills. The teachers who want to specialize and have a partner they can work with are choosing to do that. The teachers who want to stay self-contained and do right by all the content areas are staying self-contained. Uh, so I, th I think you have particular strengths in, in any particular strengths and trade-offs in all those situations. I don't question the ability of the, it, of the teachers to teach the right. curriculum that's so watered down. Michael, one of the questions that I get often that, that has to do with this is um, when you say that there is a curriculum written for fifth grade math, for example, and it should be the same in all classrooms, I'm hearing that it isn't, and the question that I'm asked often is who is accountable for seeing that that happens? Who in the system can, can guarantee to a parent that it's going to be consistent across the grade level. And Michael, can I say something too on um, that vein? I have the program guide on the front seat of my car and I look at it periodically, particularly for math, because from the beginning of the year I've been aware of the fact that certain classrooms started with a review of math facts and started building on that and added, you know, everything that was supposed to be included in the curriculum for fifth grade. And I think at the end of the year, if you ask each teacher in fifth grade, have you covered fraction? Yes. Have you done this? But the way in which it's done is so different. One classroom <coughs> might spend a week, literally, on fractions, whereas another classroom has incorporated drilling and uh, the finding the least common denominator and adding and subtracting. And it's, it's just not at all equal. So if you asked each teacher, the teacher would respond, yes, I have, in fact, covered all of these topics, but they're, they're just not covered in an equal fashion. If I can just add to that, um, I, I, I recently had a conversation with a teacher who I have all the respect for in the world um, about this issue because my son just took a test that was given a to various students in his grade level from different classrooms. And all of the kids have been exposed, or not been exposed, to different aspects of the math curriculum. So in taking this test, there is a disparity in, um, in exposure. 
And in talking to a teacher about it, the way she explained it to me was that there is a specific curriculum for the fourth grade. And teachers are expected to follow that curriculum, but of course no one is overseeing and in the watching to see how they're following it. So that if one teacher decides to go ahead and teach decimals <coughs> and teach it adding and subtracting fractions, no one's there to stop that teacher, but it has been determined that those things are not to be taught in fourth grade, having, um, having consulted with fifth grade teachers who say, no, fourth graders don't need that. So the position some of us find ourselves in is we will have students who finish fourth grade who have never been exposed to certain aspects of mathematics competing with other students who will finish fourth grade having been exposed to those things. And um, it may all even itself out, but if there are occasions where testing is involved to qualify students for different programs, um, there's a real disparity that results, I think, in some unfairness. And so it's not criticizing the teachers that the curriculum has been developed so much, but there is not any consistency. And, um, and it's something that is imperative. What the, excuse me, I don't need to cut I, you I, I, I can, uh, Jody, you know, uh, there, there is a content and a coverage that's specified at each grade level. And if a teacher feels like they've gotten through what's called for in fractions, uh, and they feel that the kids have attained you know, whatever mastery they were, they were looking for, <coughs> um, then I would hate then I then I would hate to see the teacher just stop there and say we're done. And, and so if they're going further, because okay. that that's great. I mean, teachers, th this curriculum is not meant to be a ball and chain. You know, a lot is telling teachers that they are not to do things. Uh, when in fact part of what we want to do is trust teachers' judgment and decision making about what's best for their students. If another teacher, uh, in working with their, in, with, with their class, feels like uh, they need to spend more time with that coverage on fractions, and that's the decision they make, then uh, that's, that, those are valid dis differences that teachers choose. Uh, but if they don't teach you, it because... You don't want to argue for so much uniformity that... that uh, that people are no longer able to respond to kids. But the impression that I had was that in some cases it was not being taught in order to um, respond to an agreement within the grade level that it would not be taught. Part of what you're addressing, Julia, I think is some, there, there are a couple of things here. One thing is um, the evaluative process. You know, I've heard several folks say, who's responsible for this? Well, this a lot of this um, comes up in the evaluative process, and, and we are absolutely responsible for that. So I'm pleased to hear if there are questions or concerns. <coughs> I, I need you to hear them. Secondly, um, we're talking about teachers making decisions about instructional practices or about what children need to be, be taught when, making determinations of, of that nature. And the ability of different teachers to differentiate that curriculum within their classroom for, for students. Being able to um, make judgments, as Michael said, about what curriculum is in place, where a student is, and where that student, you know, where, where they're making the judgment, where that student needs to be. And um, I would hope that teachers are not making judgments, judgments about curriculum and saying simply, this is fourth grade curriculum, therefore a student is locked into this place and position. Um, if that is happening, those are the kinds of things that we need to talk about, we need to talk to parents about, we need to talk to teachers about. Because children need to work at the level, and I think we all share this, this um, goal for our kids. Kids need to be working <coughs> where they're challenged and at the level that they need to receive the instruction. Um, that's something that, that, that we need to talk about and we need to work on if that's, what, if that's a thing that we're hearing from them. I think a major issue here is assessment. Um, in a small system like this where, um, you know, over a period of time there have been a number of issues that have uh, uh, 
been addressed, some of them organizational issues, some of them a variety of other curriculum issues too, as far as that goes. Um, what we need to know is what the kids can do. And we need to set some reasonable standards for certain uh, benchmarks, certain milestones that all students have by a certain, you know, they'll have a certain competence by a certain time. That's obviously what we're talking about here. We can't accomplish this until we really do a good job on, you know, all the way through. I mean, we have to have some handle on how, what is a reasonable expectation and so on. Um, I believe that the, uh, one of the most interesting and powerful um, engines driving reform is assessment. Whether it's a nationals test, I mean, there are, I have some quarrels, as do many people, with <coughs> some of the specifics of the MBAs. But one of the things it does do is raise some questions and make some comparisons, some of which are probably sounder than others. Uh, but at the same time, there are certainly some interesting questions that deserve to be asked of you know, those kinds of people. Um, I think if you were looking at the paper this week and you saw the questions that the uh, National Humanities is suggesting are used by company, uh, countries other than the United States, they are suggesting a much greater capacity to write essays and to uh, bring together information into a kind of um, uh, organized uh, way. And that one of the issues that sometimes uh, where Americans are accused of over-testing kids with the wrong tests. <coughs> so th those are issues, they're legitimate issues, but when you, you are concerned about where your child is, whether you know this format will work as well, whether this program will work as well, um, and then there are legitimate concerns about forcing people to do a what they don't understand thoroughly, or b what uh, that puts them uh, into a mode they are, are absolutely familiar with, and the results will be worse than what was before. Uh, those are all organ very real organizational issues for improvement in schools, uh, all of which I think we have some concerns about. <coughs> Susan, did you have a question back there earlier? Well, I, I don't know. I can't even wait. I don't know if I would jump in again or it might be something you talked about. I just wanted to know if um, if the fourth grade children who are in the um, call it challenge program now, or whatever you call it, um, what do they call it now? The gift and account program. Um, is that program going to stay in place for next fall? Is there any question that that will be taken away? We're going to talk about that later. Oh, part two. Yeah. We haven't gotten to part one. Oh, so. I would just like to make a comment. Um, my name is Cheryl Sherburn, and we're new to the community. We came from an area um, up in the Dan Muscata area. My children went to a private school. We, our kids are bright, and we felt that we were coming, we thought we had done all the research in coming to this area. We checked scores, and I'm not an educator, I'm a nurse, and so that's all I had to look at. You know, I called the Department of Education, they sent me all the test scores. <clears throat> when we came here in August to register, we didn't know if we were going to, um, well, because of the house, we didn't know if it was a go. So we registered, and then if it was a go, um, we came, which we registered. I had all those, quote, assessments that my son had had been given. He scored 99 and 100 percentile in the math and the verbal. Um, he's a year younger than the other children. And nothing was mentioned about where to place him. It was just, um, and consequently, because he didn't want to move here, um, it was a fluff here for him. Um, I'll be honest, I mean, he, um, the teacher has been very good. And I kept saying, you know, it was just, it's a hard move. He didn't want to come. He had no active role in house hunting. Um, he had his core group of friends. It was very difficult. So we thought, well, we'll let it go. You know, we'll just let him ride this out. He's a year anyway ahead of the other kids. It wasn't until a month ago that Mr. Lynn said, oh, your kid is bright. Um, I'd like to have him tested by Mrs. Bell. And he's now in a program, but it's taken, and part of it was our fault too, but if someone was a little more aggressive and said, look, you know, this is where you're coming from, this is what we have to offer. Um, and I felt that we were not offered that opportunity. Now I see that it sounds like you're going to reduce yeah. access to that opportunity. And I'm sure that there are other kids that are equally you know, on right. that same level and, and they're coasting in the fifth they're grade. Coasting in the fifth they're coasting in math. And the thing we've said here is in addressing math. the in reduction math. of that issue. We haven't even gotten into that particular right. issue. I mean, clearly this is the beginning of, or a, a, a piece of what has been going on to some degree before, but as far as 
what we're talking about tonight, a piece of an attempt to put more intellectual rigor in everybody's program. But there is another piece we're going to address, which is again. Are you saying that there are, are teachers in the elementary school who are not qualified to teach pre-algebra? There are teachers teaching in elementary school, fully certified, but as far as the lower grades are concerned, I'm not sure that there's ever been an expectation that they would be qualified at the third and fourth grade to teach pre-algebra. Pre-algebra is usually, has been traditionally at least, in the upper grade level. Um, I'm not saying that they aren't, and we do in fact have people that are, but I think that one of the, one of the across the board issues is to make sure that everybody who is teaching math um, I mean, we've gone through a process here of discussing uh, a way of making sure that all teachers in all grade levels do have an increased uh, awareness of math and math education, and that some are going to have more because they're going to be specializing in math. But that's not to say that they aren't qualified, based on the qualification. Uh, hearing this um, gentleman's concerns or, and, and the lady's concerns about her son who had spent a whole year here um, before a teacher recognized a program that might be appropriate. Um, I would like to remind you uh, that we do have a school board policy that states that parents should every year be informed of the educational opportunities that are available to all children. You know, it, there has been a lot of um, unpleasantness and a lot of uh, concern on the part of parents in and out of these special, uh, many people call them perks, many people call them, uh, you know, needs. needs, many people call them lots of different things uh, depending upon whether they have helped their child be challenged or whether their child has been one who has been excluded and they feel they're not challenged. Um, I think many people have had the experience of having um, children on one or the other side of that door, the same children or different children, um, sort of almost in a happenstance way. There doesn't seem to be any real rhyme or reason to who is included and who is excluded and who, when who is included is included when they're excluded. It just doesn't seem to make sense to a lot of people. So for one thing, I would like to remind you that you really sh have a responsibility to inform in, by writing every parent every year of all these uh, little secret for the fact that they're not publicized programs that we do run. So that's I, I one thing. I'm saying they're secret because they're not publicized. I'm not saying they're secret because we mean to keep them secret. But many people feel that they are uninformed about them, that they don't know anything about them. And so how can you possibly say, I think this would benefit my child, when you don't even know a program exists? So I, do, I know that we have the responsibility to do it. Um, secondly, I would like to just ask, since, since um, we seem to be at a juncture where we are going to at least make an attempt, and, and I hope it will be very successful, to challenge all of our students, certainly in the area of mathematics, which I, I'm sure is a, a well recognized as a crying need, that all the parents, since leveling will start now in the seventh grade, which apparently heretofore has not been done, would you please send all the parents information as to the criteria as to what will make the teacher decide that one child is appropriate to be in the transitional math program and one in the seventh grade math program? There are some of us who feel that it's very important, in fact, absolutely crucial, that our children get the most math, the most uh, quality math that they can the fastest that they can take advantage of it and well take advantage of it. And so it seems to me that if there are certain children that are not ready for transitional math, it may not be that they're not able to be ready, but that they just haven't been prepared due to a happenstance. You only need to have a, a couple of features <coughs> in a row that are not um, aggressive in the math situation to have your child shut out of transitional math, which to me is the most appropriate um, math for a lot of kids in the seventh grade. So would you please be sure that you give us that information 
so that the parent teacher of the school <coughs> partnership can exist rather than have a teacher uh, as expert as I'm sure they are solely determine which of our children are going to be doing the higher level more challenging math and which of them will be put in the you know hopper and, and I really have to say I, I think it's absolutely crucial that you include parents in that decision and that you give parents the opportunity to see what preparation is necessary to see what skills and what readiness the children need to have to be in transitional math so that if they don't have it the day school ends in June, perhaps their parents would like to see to it that they do have it by the time the day school starts in September. And I think it's very, very important that that be done. I, I think that we, we can do that, absolutely. Um, we have a, an orientation night for incoming seventh grade students and parents on June 4th. And certainly at that night, you'll hear more about this information. And uh, we can have some of that information ready for parents and families to pick up that night. And people who are unable to attend, we can certainly be sure that you get that um, kind of thing. I do want to let people know on the transition math, too, that actually we will have a small number of sixth grade students who will probably be in transition math classes. Um, and those recommendations are coming to us from fifth grade teachers, um, which pretty much goes along with the University of Chicago format idea that a small percentage of a sixth grade class would be ready to take transition math and then it becomes, and I can envision this, and it's a maybe because I don't predict the future, but um, that in the future, transition math will become more of our standard seventh grade math classes. Um, and then algebra being more accessible to more of our eighth grade students in the future. We're not at that point yet. Um, we need to help get students ready so we don't put them in something too early and too fast and make it seem to them, their interpretation is, I can't do math and they give up on math, and we don't want that to happen. <coughs> so we do want to go a little bit slow on that, but I do see that coming down the road for us. If kids are put in the transitional math program in sixth or seventh grade, for one reason or another, if parents say, I definitely want my child in there, for example, and you have you know, a certain number of kids in there that really aren't keeping up, one of the age-old problems we seem to go around and around about with is, is the course then slowed down to meet the needs well, of those that's, students? Well, that's a dilemma for us, Jan, and I, I don't know. Our problem with, with that, it, in all the middle school research that talks a lot about heterogeneous grouping, the one class that people agree you probably cannot group heterogeneously is mathematics instruction. But that needs to be more of a homogeneous grouping. Because some students, all students have the ability, and we believe that all students have the ability to learn mathematics, but they learn it at a different pace, at a different depth, and with different strategies. And that's the difference in the way that you instruct mathematics. So in a situation like that, we would need to talk with parents and with the board, obviously, to help us come to some kind of a resolution to that. Do we open up our classes and let people come in and here are the standards and the expectations? Um, the seventh grade math program in the middle school is probably our next best math program in that it is somewhere between. It is not the Addison Wesley math program, which we are all dissatisfied with. Um, John Casey and Tom Wilbur have worked over the last three to four years in developing that math program. And it is close to um, the transition math program. They have incorporated a lot of the national standards um, in their, their curriculum. So it's not a bad program to go to. Um, kind of thing. But we're going to need some guidance from you on what you would like us to do in that situation. Do you want us to have them stay in there? And then yes, the pacing has to become slower. Or do you want us to, to run it with the standards and say, you're welcome to come in and see if you can meet these standards. And if, if it isn't for you right now, we would like to encourage you to do the seventh grade math program and then move to transition math at a later time. I'd like to see us get that resolved before the school year starts so that it's not something that we... I think we would like to have that as well. Uh, just a very short comment in response to Nancy's observation that you can't teach math heterogeneously in middle school. I don't think that you can, when, after, when children achieve a certain um, uh, ability in math, whether it's third grade or fourth grade, they also should not be taught heterogeneously. And well, when I you have... I ask you about that. You, you said, uh, what, what did you mean when you said we, we used to do that? Well, did, when my daughter was in third grade, they had five different levels of math that were being taught. 
and when she was in fourth grade, they tested them for math and they placed in different levels. And they did it in grade five within the classroom. In grade six, they eliminated all of that in reading and in math. Up until that point, they also divided the children according to reading. Yeah, that went on for years. For years. You always. Sometimes I leveled in, that was, in the classroom and sometimes yeah. leveled yeah. where you went to other classes. So, so what I, the, the, point, the point I want to make is this, that there may be some children who, that some standard has been set two grades ahead. You test two grades ahead and then you're in, in town, which is fine. Okay. But then you have this, this, large, this large area, this gray area of children who may be testing a year to a year and a half ahead. But they're taught with everyone else. And they're held back. And if the teacher doesn't care about math, then they're particularly held back. And so they should that all be locked together. Can I be real clear? Can I make one more statement? They have a level two math that they, that they instituted this year. It's enrichment. It's not, it's not vertical learning. It's horizontal learning, which, which is fine. But still, those children are not learning the concepts that they're very capable of learning. And, and I maintain that they have to do some, some kind of leveling. And, and it has to be fluid so that children can move in and out of it. I'll, one case in point, my daughter is no longer at the school. She's 23. She was placed in an eligible one class in seventh grade because they felt that's according to her records here, that's where she should be. She was totally lost. She did not have the, um, the, the work that she needed to be in, in that class. And even she realized she was in over her head. There are other children from Cape who, who did, who were placed in that class and remained in it. They had been allowed to go on through a seventh grade math book. They had been given pre-algebra. My daughter didn't have any of that. So she didn't have the tools. What did we decide to do? It was obvious to her and to us that she was misplaced. So she went to the other class where she's, you know, very successful and she'll have algebra next year in eighth grade. And so to answer, you know, um, Jan's question, if a child, if it doesn't work, I mean, the child doesn't want to be in a situation I mean, that's, that's untenable for them. And, and there has to be an understanding before that if it doesn't work, then, you know. But I really think this gray area has to be, I don't think you can teach heterogeneous. I think it's a big mistake. A lot of children are losing out. So you see your argument that I think that recommendation doesn't go far enough. If that, that's if that still if that still states that, that that math will be taught heterogeneously, I would say it does not go far enough. It has to be more specialized. That recommendation seems to rest on the assumption that self-contained classrooms and specialized classrooms accomplish the same thing. That there's no real difference between the two. I mean, if you're if you're if you're telling us that the specialized classrooms and the self-contained classrooms, our children will get the same training. That's the assumption you appear to be making. It would seem to me that you ought to have an opinion as to which of these approaches is the better approach. And if your opinion is that specialized training is the better approach, at least that should be your long-term objective. You may not want to move to it in one year, but it ought to be an objective. I mean, we rely on you for these sorts of judgments. And, uh, you know, uh, I look at that and I worry just at the fact that it's it's a, it's, a, it's a mixed recommendation. You know, it's what, a fair question. Which, which one, uh, why are we doing it this way? I wonder if, if you did that, if you made a choice, if you run into the same problem that I heard recently with whole language. Yes, you want to support whole language and make it work, but it may not work for every child. You may want specialized teachers, but it may not work for every child. It may not work for every teacher. I think I what, what we're clearly saying, going back to my comments when I started this, that the... Um, a variety of reasons the change is a massive change in our thinking about schools. I mean, I, I do a fair amount of time with people in business uh, and beginning to use in some areas that are not pertinent to this evening's discussion some total quality task force groups. Um, and I see that as a useful approach for organizational change uh, in general. Um, and I've been listening to some of the struggles of American business to get a handle on how to do things better, particularly how to be uh, more in tune with what customers want. You obviously are customers, and part of the reason we're here tonight is to listen to what you have to say. But part of our ability to change should rest on our ability to change well. A teacher in a self-contained classroom who already is teaching math can get some extra support from some of our 
other resources <coughs> that Michael outlined so that that person can do a better job of teaching the program they're already doing. We can also continue to work on our assessment because actually there are some children who may in fact profit by being in with one teacher all day long. There's a, a fair uh, number actually who from a personality point of view do well. Uh, and we, we believe that we are not um, locking ourselves into something that we can't do a good job on. I think the real issue here is for us to understand as a community and a school system we're in an evolving situation. We need to test and assess and um, figure out a lot of ways in which you can help give us the kind of feedback some of you are giving us tonight. Um, because that's the only way we can be sure that we're doing it better and better. Well, let me, let me just say one additional thing. I happen to be in the teaching business myself and I manage teachers. Um, when Michael earlier on said uh, we made a decision not to force any classroom teacher to adopt the specialized approach if they wish uh, to, uh, to maintain a self-contained classroom, it seems to me that that's a very different approach from an approach that makes an assessment that this teacher is doing the kind of job that would justify allowing that teacher to maintain a self-contained classroom. And I'm a little bit concerned the pressures are very great. I know from my own experience to uh, do what teachers want to do mm. as opposed to provide the kind of guidance and, and make the kind of tough decisions that need to be made. So I just throw that out. Sure. My concern, though, was generated by the comment about how the decisions were made uh, as to which would be self-contained. David, I, I do want to ass assess how uh, the curriculum you're writing, how, how kids are mastering it. We do want we do want to take a look at specially uh, at the specialized classrooms versus the self-contained classrooms. Um, but but it's not but it's not clear at this point that uh, that's the right thing to do for all students or it's the right thing to do for all teachers. And until that becomes clearer. Um, I have a faith in people working through this in terms of in terms of what's best for them and and, and, and the conditions under which they're going to be able to give the best to their students. If we were to force teachers to specialize against their will, we could we could end up very much weakening the experience for those kids that year. And I'm I'm not ready to do that. And the, teach and the teachers aren't ready yet either. Every, the teachers who are staying self-contained and the teachers who are speaking will be doing a lot of talking to each other next year. They'll be doing a lot of sharing of, of the experience together. I think what maybe what, what parents would like to know is that there is going to be somebody that is going to hold everybody accountable, whether they're teaming or whether they're self-contained, to have a quality math program. Jim, that's, that's the job of the building administrators. It's not my job to hold teachers accountable. Well, how do we hold teachers accountable? Maybe that's the question we should ask. Well, how do you know, obviously, it? ultimately, is the responsibility of the or organization, with myself as a superintendent, and a variety of, of ways. Um, <coughs> an accountable, uh, you know, I think the uh, the pressure go, we keep going back to assessment. What can the students do? Now, if the students can't do something because they haven't been taught it, and some of the concerns <coughs> that I hear expressed here uh, appear to flow from that, or the fact that it may have been covered but not covered very well. In other words, it's something that got out there, but there are, are uh, um, it's a variety of reasons, wasn't learned. What's taught and what's learned, two different things. Those are those are issues we simply have to come to grips with. If, if you people are telling us that you see some things that, that aren't working, um, we look at some test scores and we see some things that aren't working, we have to do something about it. Connie, can I just read a paragraph from my husband's letter um, just to see if other parents share this feeling? They might not, and we might be off base, but I'd just like to get a general consensus of how people in this room feel. Uh, my husband wrote a letter asking for more <coughs> accountability in math. 
Um, he, I'll read two things. He said, parents have expressed, this followed another math meeting, okay, concern about different teachers offering vastly different work assignments in mathematics. The administration should respond to these valid parental concerns and try to ensure relative equality in such work. The new mathematics program must be validated by some formal standardized testing so that we can compare how our children are doing relative to others. I think it is inadequate to rely on testing at the fourth grade, eighth grade, and eleventh or twelfth grade, because the time spans are simply too long. Yearly testing seems a minimum to me. The school might even consider testing the different classes throughout the year to help allay parental concerns that one or more classes are lagging far behind the others. Okay, now, do people find that offensive, or would you like that? Or no comment? I think it's been stated by several people already, and I think it's a view widely held that there's a huge difference in the apparent expertise as witnessed by what happens in the classroom and in instruction from classroom uh -huh. to classroom. Are you saying, and though, that, that you could measure a teacher's performance by how well the children do? It would seem the obvious way to measure. Uh -huh. But I still don't have anybody speaking, so your administration if you, if you can only hear my voice. If you heterogeneous grouping, that uh -huh. would be an assessment. And we have heterogeneous grouping. Mm -hmm. We do have it now. We don't have at the third, fourth, or fifth grade level mm -hmm. students have specialized or level. So therefore, it would be a way of measuring the teacher's effectiveness. Because well, you, you would have a broad range of children. Are we here to judge teachers, or are we here to to teach children <coughs> according to their individual needs. I don't I don't want to have any kind of a witch hunt against teachers. I, I don't think that's the point. I think the point is that the children overall are not being challenged in math. Bottom line. But how do you measure that, Margaret? Can I can I have a scenario maybe of some of what we're dealing with? Because part of part of our sense of of achievement certainly has to do with the level of discussion going on around with all of our teachers. The issues that Michael was pointing out in Strand A and in service and all that stuff. And and of course, you know, standardized test scores that we can get in. I was delighted to see that our math scores did come up from 35 points this year and 15 if you don't include handicap scores back up to 379 with non-handicap scores and an absolute closure of the gender gap, which I was really pleased to see. Fourth grade. Now, what, I, what I'm hearing Margaret talk about, and I, and I have some real um, sympathy with that issue of what do we do with heterogeneous classes that are, are really good for young learners to, to be in with, with mixed ability groupings, but how does a teacher deal with that range? And it only gets wider and wider as they go on up through the school. And, and the, the two issues that teachers talk about and make choice about at this point is, uh, are the options A, do I teach around a uh, concept issue in my class and then choose to offer differentiated experiences based on that single concept? In other words, you're teaching an introduction to multiplication, for example, in third grade, but you've got some kids who are going to be able to move like this and you ought to have some some uh, accelerated and, stre and stretching opportunities for them. Some kids who are, who are really getting it well and need some continued rehearsal, and groups of kids who need more practice and reteach to get going. So that's one approach. You simply teach whole group and then offer differentiated experiences and expectations for your wide range. It's hard, but it's doable. The other choice is you choose those areas of your curriculum, like time and measurement, like geometry, et cetera, that do pretty well whole group and offer lots of really good experiences. But in the areas of, of operation computation, you do instructional groupings. And you have three or four little groups that are working at the edge of ability, and you plan for meeting with those groups differently and having them sort of in different places instructionally. Two very different options, two options that teachers talk about and examine all the time. Um, I've, taught, I've taught in third grade both ways. One of them's easier to pull off than the other, frankly. Going straight with instructional groupings is a little easier to pull off, although you then set up that whole notion of, ha ha, I'm in long division, and you're still just doing subtraction with trading. You know, there's that whole self-esteem issue that we very much try to, try to protect and guard. But I think that, in fact, um, the idea of going leveling across classes doesn't belong well below fifth grade. 
But I am adamant that within classes, we do have to do the best job we can of identifying the instructional level and meeting children's needs within that wide range, wide range classroom. Now, the notion of going to specialization would allow some teachers um, who really like to focus on that um, to offer that curriculum uh, twice a day rather than planning all those instructional groupings plus all their instructional groupings around <coughs> reading and writing. We have some teachers who literally have said to us, I don't care how busy that makes me. I would prefer to teach full content. I like the ability to make connections full content. And I believe I can better serve kids by being able to offer math, science, social studies, and reading and writing, language arts, myself. There are other teachers who equally affirm the fact that they feel they would do uh, better by their children. <coughs> they can, in fact, focus on their ability to differentiate math and offer a real and rich science curriculum twice a day. I feel really good that teachers have made good choices about that this first year. I feel really good that there are options for fourth grade because I heard a lot of feedback from third grade teachers that some, not, not majority, but some third grade parents were still a little concerned about specialty in fourth grade already and asked not to be placed in specialized classrooms. And I do think at some point we really um, so we, we try to do some partnering attempts with parents this year about making best choices for kids and, and style. And I would say to you, if you have real strong feelings one way or the other, communicate that with your current teachers. We need to know that, okay? I um, really look forward to the chance to getting back in frontline grade five math because I have very strong feelings about how this program can be more empowering for kids and how we can um, really partner with them and sort of contracting how far they'd like to go as learners in the fifth grade. And I think, you know, uh, this whole notion of having some specialty teachers uh, working together and supporting those who are deciding to stay classroom-based is going to be a real powerful model, and I feel really positive about it. So. Let's take an organizational break here for a second. Uh, we have a whole second segment, uh, don't we? Well, actually, what we certainly, you know, felt, <laughs> we knew we were fighting off a lot, but this is also a time of year when there's very, very little time available to us. The third strain tonight, the GT strain, is actually not, uh, we were not anticipating any particular changes in the program, more solidifying what we do have. I know that I had some con <coughs> telephone calls or notes, and I tried to get back to people who asked me whether, you know, concerned we were somehow thinking of dropping level three, I guess it's called, or what, I think your question is still about challenge. No, we have not. Um, there is, uh, however, uh, I understand a history of trying to broaden out and try some different approaches from the uh, approaches tried back along, and we were prepared to talk about that tonight. But I don't know if we, if, you know, 20 minutes past nine, if people really want to open up uh, that whole aspect, or if there are a couple of questions that people have, or some burning issues, or do we need to get back together again, or would you like to meet with us in a small group, or what, you know, what would you like to do? What are the concerns on that? Man, just, uh, well, this is a specific thing, and I'm not really, it, it almost addresses what we had talked about before in uh, accountability criteria, but it's also the same kind of, it's expectations. Uh, I have a daughter in a supposedly honors 10th grade geometry class. I don't think they're going to complete three quarters of the book this year. And I, I find that so absolutely unbelievable that it, it just, I don't know what a parent is to do to address this kind of a concern. Now, I don't know, is that your department, Wayne? Is a 10th grade honors class gifted and talented? Or is that just, you know, the ordinary uh, one of the milk kids or what? I don't know, but I, I just find it mind boggling and I don't know what parents can do before the fact to make sure these kinds of things don't happen because next year these kids are left absent a chunk of material that they need to have to move along. I think that's it. Actually, Fred, I think that's an excellent question that pervades the whole discussion here. You know, when, when Jan Solon a couple of months ago said, I'd like a workshop on gifted talent. Um, it raised in my mind the fact that we've, we've had three major workshops for the board on gifted talent in the last 28 months. We've had eight meetings. This is the eighth meeting that would include gifted talent. 
month ago on an April night, she said, I want to, I'll stand up so you don't have to peer around my dark. Uh, <clears throat> when she said, I'd like to shift that focus a bit to high expectations for all kids, that struck me as an educator, not uh, just a director of a gifted education program. This is the kind of dialogue that I know Connie has brought here uh, in, in view of the future for us. She's opened the window for this. And the, those kinds of issues need to keep coming back to the system. I think the system um, uh, suffered a bit from uh, the absence of this kind of dialogue. It's this kind of point you make, and others well made tonight, that have to get out here to us to address that specific point, Fran. Um, I have to defer a bit to Frank because although I participate in discussions about that, for example, uh, I meet with, with Frank and some of his staff and we've been talking uh, this year around a tough area, as I understand it, historically in Cape Elizabeth, and I don't have as much familiarity with it as nearly everyone else in this room, and that is the issue of standards set in or for high school coursework. But I know it does have some history, and I've not ever heard uh, much resolution about that. So we began to entertain that question through conversations about gifted education at the high school level. So I th it's, it's an issue that I think needs to get out front on the table and that uh, allows us to, to respond to it and also hear the vignettes that you raise and others have so that we can adjust to them. And up to this point, very frankly, we haven't had a lot of open dialogue that allowed us to do that. Frank, do you want to add to anything relative to the, that friend's particular point about honors and the book? It's probably mean finishing the book? And it's probably. Uh, no, I don't particularly because I'm not sure that I can give her um, an accurate answer about what will be the consequences of not finishing the book. I have talked with um, a geometry teacher about where they are in the book and, and uh, the, the relative pace through the geometry text. And since this is the first year they've taught this geometry course, I think the teachers are, are trying to assess where they can speed up, where they need to slow down, and just the, the, the fit of the curriculum. And I. Uh, think that that is going to be adjusted in succeeding years so that it works well. I think uh, it also depends on which math course uh, students are taking uh, geometry will, will move into. I think most of the geometry students this year will take trig. I think, I think that's correct. Isn't it, Michael, this year's geometry students move to trig, whereas next... Uh, and so the, the understanding is that, that a, a number of the things at the end of that geometry book, um, as I remember looking at the table of contents with the teacher, um, were some of the, the beginning parts of trig. So I'm not sure how big an issue it is, but I will find out um, because I'm curious about it. You know, I'm curious about the observation, and I think I ought to be able to get back to you, Fran, with an answer. Well, actually, I'm calling for the teachers, I'm sure. Thank you, but I... I would like to discuss it with her, but it's those kinds of things that I just find so unbelievable. And I guess to reiterate, I find it unbelievable that it's always after the fact that we're going to worry about it for the next year's kids or the ones after that. Who was worrying about it for this year's 10th grade geometry kids? That this is a book, the book assumedly is our new Chicago textbook, supposedly a terrific textbook, supposedly worked out so that this is a one year's quote work of geometry work. And here we finish maybe through the 11th chapter out of 16. We hope to be through the 11th chapter. I mean, it, it's just, it's mind-boggling. And I just, the accountability issue is really a serious issue. The gifted and talented issue, I think, I, my observation is that we have politically in this town used the gifted <coughs> and talented programs to call off the curriculum dogs because really and truly we haven't addressed curriculum, we just sort of quiet down those of us, those many people who are really interested in the higher achievement, the higher expectations for their students, and it's kind of a way to pacify them, to pacify us. 
And I think that it, it's a really, that whole issue should be addressed. And I think it's used that, it has, doesn't, hasn't been intended to be that. I think it hasn't been intended to be used that way. I think that's the way it has uh, too often uh, come out. And, and I know I've been in that position myself. I think, well, at least they're in challenge. You know, at least they'll get something there. But really, it's, it's, just, it's just not right. It's a fascinating insight. Um, and uh, the, the, certainly, I think the, my, my original statement about raising expectations, um, there are, uh, th these things are always relative. I mean, I think, frankly, what, what is uh, of alarm, alarming a lot of American parents, uh, teachers, and so on, um, is that awful, unsettling feeling that our kids are actually learning less than we did and learning less than one would expect people in a technological society to learn. Um, and we can all point fingers at television and, you know, what do the kids do with their spare time and so on and so forth, how much time are they spending on athletics, how much time are they spending on working or, or hobbies or just playing socializing. I mean, you know, that's why we need to talk to each other because one of the things that drives me in trying to think about reorganizing schools in general, and this school system in particular, uh, time is one of our very precious resources. Um, I was hoping that we would have a lot of kids sign up for the capability academic camps that Sue Weatherby uh, has set up. So far, I understand they're very under-enrolled. Um, I was hoping that that would be a resource the community would see as a way to uh, extend the school year. I mean, admittedly, uh, it is, uh, you know, we need to put some money in the budget, or she puts some money in her budget. She has money, I don't. Um, and uh, to try to provide scholarship help for people who were interested in that. And I would urge you to look at that folder or in your conversations with other parents, whether it's of interest to you personally. I think that's a concept, again, that we need to talk about as a, a school community group. Um, because the use of time, we are looking at the use of time in our regular programs, you know, long programs. We are talking about ways in which we can perhaps even um, look at extending our own. We, we do have teachers working in the summer and so forth, but I mean, what other possibilities are there out there? Um, we're worried about kids being distracted. I mean, one of the problems uh, with with learning is that you have to learn how to do close reading. It's not just enough to learn how to read. You have to learn how to read very close material and elicit uh, complicated meaning out of documents. It's part of the information age. It's an re absolute requirement. Um, I used to teach Latin. I guess I would like to incorporate some of that. But those are all issues that we talk about, we know something about, and we really sincerely want to get to. Um, we're not going to do it overnight. This is an evolving issue, but your candor, both in a meeting like this, with your conversations with the school board, with us individually, uh, and obviously with your classroom teacher. And part of our job organizationally is to make sure that classroom teachers do not feel threatened by your candor, and that they see ways by which they can rethink perhaps some of the strategies that they're using. Some of these things could be, could be addressed rather simply, not necessarily absolutely so, but some of them really um, are not mind-boggling problems. Some of them are more so than others, but it sounds to me like what we are starting here, uh, that we've already begun in a couple of meetings we've had uh, in the last few months, is a kind of community dialogue. I just wanted to let you know that a group of us are planning on having some widespread community dialogues beginning in the fall to talk about what, what real, what, how specific can we be about the educational outcomes that this community wants to set. I mean, you've given us some clues. I, you can, we can talk about that in more detail. Yeah. I think one of the things that, uh, with gifted and talented, that, that, well, there are two points that I want to bring up, is that whether it be challenge or you call it level three or whatever, I think that there are many people in the community who feel that at this point in time, their child is capable of doing that work. And that if they're excluded from that, then, then they are really missing out on something. Um, I'd like to see the, the level three work truly be for the top two percent or whatever, and the level two work be for the very high achieving students and really be good, solid, um, advanced work so that
people can say, oh yeah, the kids that are in level three, you know, whether it be two kids or whatever, that's work my child just couldn't do. And so that's fine that those kids are able to do that. But they don't sit back and say, my kid's really missing out on something because I know that, that it's just not that hard and my child could, could be doing that. And, and the other thing is, if you're using SRA scores to determine who's going to be in these programs, and we're talking about uneven teaching below that, where is the, the uh, fairness in that? And what about the kids who have had teachers that haven't, and once again, it's not to attack the teachers, but it's just, you know, where is the fairness in that? I was, I, I'd like to get back to the high school for a moment because I, I still consider Wayne's remarks to be very insightful. Uh, and, and Fran's question still puzzles me too. Are there, I, I see some changes and some plans next year for the elementary school and the middle school. Do you see any uh, intensity <coughs> being given to more substantive material and covering uh, a broader range of concepts? And I'm, I'm perhaps the wrong guy to ask about the substantive concepts in the, in the in the math curriculum, and I think Michael might be able to address that. I, my understanding is, yeah. Well, no, I, 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 I understand the, the math program. We we will have um, um, a large number of kids taking geometry. Only a very small number of kids taking second year algebra. And a regular, I would say a normal number of students in the high school, uh, and, and, and then a, another segment in the eighth grade taking Algebra one, And I think that that's the, the shift into that new curriculum. Um, we will also have students taking trigonometry and calculus. And I'm not sure that uh, it's necessarily going to be um, a broader range of topics than, than existed this year in the Algebra <coughs> One course or in the Geometry course. I think the, sh the Chicago Math program encompasses more concepts than a typical Geometry or Algebra course too. That is, the, the Geometry book has a lot of probability, statistics in it. It has um, uh, a, a much more uh, serious approach, I think, to, to problem solving um, that are in, in situations that are much more realistic. And I, I think that that kind of change in the math program is what is going to be in, intensifying, and that's exactly the, the direction in which the college boards are going as well. Um, so I, I think that the math program at the high school is really in sync w with, or a little bit ahead of, the, some of the changes that are going to begin to occur in, in, the, uh, in the SAT testing. I would agree with Wayne. I don't think our SAT scores are that high. I think they're quite average in some respects. And I think, as Michael said, that's one of our goals, is to, is to improve our testing in a, in a, you know, in a variety of ways, our, our, our achievement levels. It's not so much our testing, but improve our achievement levels, because we, we are looking at different ways of assessing uh, math as well as other subjects. But one of the things we want kids to do, and we fully expect them to do, is to be successful in college applications. And I think that, you know, uh, it's, it's an important factor for the high school, and, and I think this high school's kids are successful. I mean, I'm not sure why nobody got into BC this year. <laughs>